For those of you who were able to join us for the first day of this three-day symposium series, welcome back. For those of you who weren't able to join us yesterday and are joining us for the first time today, welcome. We're glad that you're here. My name is John Civy, and I'm an associate professor of chemistry at Towson University. I'll be serving as the discussion leader for um, today's panel discussion. Um, where we're going to be talking about preparing for research success at primarily undergraduate institutions. And one of the things that we discussed yesterday is the idea that primarily undergraduate institutions have a lot of diversity in terms of what the um, expectations look like on faculty for research, teaching, and service, depending on the identity and the um, goals and the audience that's served by those different PUIs. And full disclosure, um, Towson University, if you sort of look into our official classification, we're, we're no longer officially a primarily undergraduate institution. I, that we're, we've changed our classification and perhaps one of my colleagues can help me get our current classification correct if you look at the, um, the, the official listings. But um, I still feel like we share a lot in common with primarily undergraduate institutions in that um, in uh, the disciplines that are represented today on the panel, um, there are no doctoral degrees that are granted in the, the fields that we're participating in. So, um, and so with that, I'd like to, to welcome you and provide a little bit of an overview of the format for today. Um, we will get a chance to hear about the academic backgrounds of our panelists and then we'll spend some time in breakout groups and then we'll have a chance to discuss what you all discussed as participants in the breakout groups and as was the case yesterday we'll have a period of prescribed Q&A with the panelists and then there'll be a time for open Q&A um, where any questions that arise from any of the attendees uh, will definitely be happy to field and then we'll have some closing remarks and we'll be wrapped up by four o'clock today. Um, that said, even though there is sort of a set aside time for open Q&A, if there is a, a question that comes up in your mind that you think is a, is a good uh, follow up on the topic that happens to be happening at that moment, please don't hesitate to use the raised hand feature and ask that question or to type it into the chat. Um, our technical coordinator, uh, Andrew Besoris, is going to be closely monitoring the chat and helping me to um, pay uh, careful attention to those things that are coming in through the chat feature. Um, but if you would just indicate that you can hear me by using the reaction option at the bottom and then selecting raised hand to make sure everyone is aware of how to use that raised hand feature. If everyone would go ahead and try that out, that'll make sure that everybody is hearing me okay and that you can find that raised hand feature. Terrific. Great. Thank you very much, everybody. You can go ahead and put your hands down. And so at this point, it is my um, pleasure to introduce our panelists for today's session. I'd like to start off with an introduction of Dr. Mary Davidas, who is an assistant professor of inorganic chemistry at Towson University. Dr. Davidas, please tell us a little bit about your academic journey so far, if you would, please. Sure. First of all, thank you, Dr. Suvi, for organizing this uh, type of event. Yeah, I was actually part of this type of an event when I was looking for jobs after my postdoctoral fellowship. So uh, the students who are um, listening in, uh, please uh, feel free to ask us questions, like Dr. Sivi said. And to go directly into the introduction, so I am an assistant professor of inorganic chemistry. I'm in my sixth year and I'm currently waiting for my tenure decisions. And I hope all of you uh, out there uh, are also looking towards a career in academics. So I completed my PhD at Western Michigan University, followed by a three year uh, postdoctoral appointment at the University of Notre Dame before joining Towson University in fall of 2015. Also before coming to the United States in 2007 to pursue my PhD, I taught college level chemistry for six years in a private institution in India. And uh, my teaching experience in the United States started uh, as a teaching assistant for a couple of years till my professor could find research funding for me. And uh, after completing uh, my PhD and postdoc, I joined TU and I have been teaching in organic chemistry for the past six years. And I've also taught a new course for the first time at Towson for 
uh, master's level applied physics students uh, based on nanotechnology, which is my uh, specialty and the foundation for my independent research program. Thank you very much, Dr. Devadas, and we're glad that you're here and looking forward to getting your insights as someone who is is right in the middle of the tenure and promotion process and and, and now as you're sort of uh, mm -hmm. fresh on your mind of what that reflection looks like of those those last six years. I'm sure. also happy to introduce um, Dr. Chris Solis, who is an Associate Professor of Environmental Toxicology at Towson University. Uh, Dr. Solis, please tell us a little bit about where you've been and where you're headed. Uh, thanks, John. Thanks for the intro. Thanks for organizing this. Uh, hello to all the participants and thanks for joining in. Um, so my, I got my PhD at University of Maryland, Baltimore um, in toxicology. And then I, I didn't really do a traditional postdoc. I took a job with the Army Public Health Command, but there was a research component to that. And, um, and, and so I was able to maintain research productivity and publish, which I think is an important point. Um, and then I, then I worked for EPA for four years, and then I went to Texas Tech University in Lubbock. And that was my first academic position, and that was 2008. So I was there for six years, um, and Texas Tech is now an R1. So it was, and when I was there, it was working towards that, but it was always uh, heavily focused on research. Um, and so then I, in 2014, I came to Towson. I, I wanted to come back to the East Coast. I wanted to come to a place where I thought I could have a, a larger impact um, in terms of, you know, influence on uh, students and the community and, and a region. Um, and I can talk more about that if you're interested. Uh, and so I've been here for six years. My research program is, uh, I bill it as applied ecology and ecotoxicology. Um, aquatic, terrestrial, um, John and I have a collaborative project that's really, really pretty cool. And um, and looking forward to hearing about your questions and thoughts today. So thank you. Thanks, Chris. And I'll also mention that uh, Chris serves as the director of our environmental science and studies program at Towson University. Our third panelist, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Lindsay So, who is an associate professor of chemical engineering at Lafayette College. Dr. So, please. Tell us about yourself. <laughs> Thank you very much for having me and thanks everyone for attending. Um, so my research path has been, well, I started as an undergraduate in California at, U, uh, at UC Berkeley and then I did my PhD at Yale. Um, and that's actually where I met Dr. Sidi. Um, and um, I was actually in environmental engineering for both of those degrees. Um, and then when I, I actually went directly to my faculty position at Lafayette College. Um, Lafayette College, if you don't know, it's a small liberal arts college in the eastern part of Pennsylvania. Um, and I actually started in chemical engineering there. Um, so it's a little interesting to kind of switch slightly the kind of field that you're in. Um, but I think at the research level, a lot of, of the research is the same. Um, so looking forward to your questions and, um, you know, just, and hopefully I can answer some related to the engineering field and, and maybe even switching a little bit. Thank you very much, Dr. So. Um, and I'll just remind the participants who uh, were here yesterday, and if you weren't here yesterday, a little bit about my background. My undergraduate degree is in chemistry from Central Michigan University. I'm, I was originally from Michigan and then um, got very tired of the cold winters in Michigan and wanted to go somewhere warmer for graduate school, which sent me to Clemson University for a master's degree in environmental engineering. And then my PhD is from Johns Hopkins University in environmental engineering and chemistry. Um, my postdoctoral work was at Yale in chemical and environmental engineering and and after that, I came to Towson University for the tenure line uh, position that I continue to hold. At this point, um, I would like to give you a chance to interact a bit with each other as uh, participants in today's panel. Um, I'm going to push everyone into breakout groups. We'll spend about eight or nine minutes in breakout groups. And I'd like you to introduce yourself to the other members of your group um, and then assign one member of your group to be the recorder and respond to a prompt that's very similar to the prompt you saw yesterday. Where, but today's prompt is going to be, how do you think research at a PUI might differ from research at a doctoral granting institution? And in the chat, I will post a link to that prompt and the tasks that I'll ask you to do in that breakout group. And so I will look forward to hearing what your group comes up with in terms of your 
postulated differences between research at a PUI and research at a doctoral granting institution on the other side of the breakout group. All right, it looks like everyone has made their way back to the main room. So welcome back, everybody. If you were assigned and or volunteered to be the recorder for your group, would you please raise your hand and go ahead and leave your hand raised until we have a chance to hear from your group. And I'd like to start with Sophia. Sophia, can you give us one of the items from your list that your group identified as a likely difference between research at a PUI versus research at a doctoral granting institution? Yeah. Um, one being that, so on R1, usually the research expectation is pretty hard set and it's, you know it across the board, whereas at PYs, it varies from institution to institution, but then also from department to department. So your research output might be, your know, expectation might be different depending maybe on like your teaching load or something like that. Thank you, Sophia. And I'd like to rely on the panelists to help serve as the fact checkers for us as we uh, field these, these observations from the breakout groups. And uh, Dr. Solis, I'd like to start with you. Could you fact check what Sophia's group uh, listed there? Does that strike you as generally true? Uh, in general, I would say yes. That In my experience, right, at Texas Tech, the research expectation was higher and explain to me clearly <laughs> in almost hostile terms so uh um but but also as well the research expectation change at a pui changes it seems to me by institution and having i now have I had a couple phd students at texas tech that are now um faculty at undergraduate institutions and so i still speak with them and yeah they have different expectations between the two of them and then different than what you know ours are here at Towson. So, um, yep, I think that there is some truth to that. Great, thank you very much, Sophia. And let's see, uh, Gowen, I'm not sure if I pronounced your name correctly. It's Gowen, but yes. That's Gowen, right. please, yes, tell us what was one of the the items on your list, Gowen. Um, we noticed we noted a probable lack of certain laboratory resources. So you're not necessarily gonna have as much space or as much high-end equipment, but uh, doesn't necessarily mean it's worse equipment or um, no resources, but you might have to not necessarily make do with the new $10 million scanning electron microscope. You might have to make do with the old $1 million one. Since you mentioned scanning electron microscopes, I have to throw this to Dr. Devadas. Um, Dr. Devadas, can you comment on, on Gowan's group's observations, please? Um, I, I knew you would come to me, Dr. Sivi, <laughs> for that. So Gowan, uh, to reiterate what your group discussed, yes, I agree that sometimes the resources will not be pre-existent. And uh, so when I came here, my research needed a scanning electron microscope, and that was the first instrument that I needed to write an MRI to um, uh, get funding to do that. So uh, my advice to students who end up at a PUI, which does, which has, uh, what to say, not all the resources that you uh, can acquire on day one, is to slowly start chipping away by writing like smaller grants and design your uh, experiments uh, and your research program centered around an instrument that you can use at that place to start off with to start collecting data and then uh, try uh, your best to acquire uh, uh, those instruments through grants or through collaborations at neighboring um, R1 institutions or even uh, like Department of Defense Army Research Lab or Naval uh, Research Lab that you can, uh, uh, sorry, Navy Research Lab that you can go in and uh, they have mini proposals that you write and you can collaborate with them and take your students over there and do research. And Dr. Devadas, you mentioned MRI. Could you tell us what that is, please? So MRI is, uh, uh, the full form for it is Major Research Instrumentation Grant uh, that the NSF National Science Foundation uh, um, uh, has a call for every year. Uh, typically those grants are, drew, uh, are due in the month of January. And uh, the advantage of being at a PUI for those MRI grants is that there is no uh, cost sharing requirement from the institution. Whereas if you're at an R1, the R1 institution has to provide a 30% cost share. So 
uh, since we are on this discussion, and um, like Dr. Sivi was saying in the beginning, Towson started off as a PUI, but now we are getting into this R3, R2 status. So if I want to write an MRI tomorrow to get, for example, a transmission electron microscope, which is close to $2 million, the university has to come up with 30% support. So yes, your observations are correct that uh, uh, some PUIs will not have the necessary resources, but it's not the end of the world. You, as faculty and academicians, we need to be able to, you know, uh, find a way around it, and we definitely find a way around these things and get our research going. So where there is a will, there is always a way. Thanks, Dr. Devadas. Diamond, I'd like to go to you next. What was one of the items on your group's list, if you would, please? Hi. Okay, Hello. So I'm trying to not repeat anything. Um, I think what we were we're kind of drawing on our experiences at, or at PUIs um, as students and as um, teaching faculty. Um, it seems like a lot. Sometimes you can have your students do research in the lab or in the lab, like in a class, um, or possibly incorporate it into like a lesson plan, like a activity. Um, some research situations. Um, but of course, yeah, we have the time limitations depending on their teaching load and the, the students' course load and uh, uh, the resources available at the school. Thank you, Diamond. Dr. So, would you like to comment on Diamond's group's observations in terms of how the students become involved in the research, whether that's uh, independently or through a course type experience? Um. I think there are a number of different ways that the students can actually get involved. Um, so I have seen students in actually both PUIs and major research universities um, go through classes where, you know, the class is actually working on a project that actually gets eventually gets published. Um, but you can also, you know, um, in, I guess, PUIs, because the faculty is looking at the undergraduates themselves as the researchers in their lab have a better chance of getting you know opportunities in the lab by being in class so for instance um, one way to that i'll recruit students sometimes is to think about the students particularly in my electives who did really well who showed a keen interest um, and say hey have you been interested in, in doing research so um, that might be a difference in terms of the way that the students are are approached Thanks, Dr. So. And at Towson University, I'll mention that it's been uh, a real financial point of emphasis the last several years in the uh, Fisher College of Science and Mathematics to fund faculty initiatives that increase access to the, what are, the so-called cures, the course undergraduate research experiences. Um, I know our dean has been uh, leveraging tens of thousands of dollars to uh, expand those types of opportunities. Um, so, and I suspect many other uh, primarily undergraduate and similarly situated universities do that. Um, Andrew, I see that you were one of the recorders as well. So Andrew, please, what was one of the items from your group's list? So what came up in our group was um, basically that there's greater turnover in a primarily undergraduate institutions like lab. So there's less time for people to learn things and there's also less people to teach new people things. So it might require more involvement from the like research advisor than at a like R1 institution where you have like a bunch of grad students teaching each other. And Dr. Solis, would you like to take that one if you would please? Sure, I would generally agree with that, um, that from in my own lab, that, that's something I constantly have to be aware of, is that, um, you know, I have students in the lab that have expertise, they're, they're doing great work, I have to anticipate that they're going to be kind of moving on, sometimes sooner, well, and a lot of times sooner than I would like, because, you know, they, they got another opportunity or they just, you know, they finish their master's um, early. Uh, and so I have to, you have to think about that kind of transfer of knowledge. Um, and it does also necessitate more involvement, um, which is a good thing, like more involvement of my time, which I like because, you know, as I've progressed in my career, I've gotten, in general, kind of further away from the lab. So it's good to, to kind of be pulled back in. Um, 
So I like that, but it is definitely something to be, to be mindful of. And there's a difference um, compared to say Texas tech and R1 where you have a four year PhD student. That's a, you know, they can train a lot of other students over that time frame. So, yeah. And one of the things that I've been increasingly aware of over the last few years in my laboratory now, as I'm looking ahead to the spring where I'm, I have, four or five seniors who are going to be graduating where I sort of did some bad planning when it came to like syncing up the students so that I don't lose a big crop all at once and then run the risk of having a lot of that institutional lab knowledge uh, graduate with those students. And so one of the things that I need to be more cognizant of um, in addition, so I, uh, truth be told, I really don't like to um, turn down ambitious and uh, ambitious students who are going to make a contribution to the lab. So I really, in truth, don't pay that much attention to when they're going to be graduating because that can change. But one of the things that I can control as a faculty member is how good of a job I do at encouraging the students to record for posterity important techniques, important methodologies, which in the last few years has also increasingly become uh, taken the form of videos where I've asked students, okay, make an instructional video of how to calibrate this instrument or how to standardize this solution or how to do this technique so that we have that institutional knowledge. Because as Dr. Solis pointed out, as faculty members, even at PUIs, it's possible, depending on the size of your lab, you, depending on how your research program ebbs and flows, you might become increasingly removed from your lab where the students are going to become the experts in a lot of cases, even beyond. Uh, if, if I haven't done it in 10 years, then I have to rely on my students to tell me how to do some of these things. Um, Mwala, I see that you were a recorder for your group as well. Please tell us about your group's discussion. Um, hi. So I think the only thing that my group um, that was brought up that hasn't already been said is um, the idea that it might be a little bit harder to like publish undergrad driven um, research. And uh, yeah, I'd be interested to hear what you all have to say about that. Uh, Dr. Devadas, would you like to take that one, please? Sure, uh, that was an interesting question. So that is something that we all grapple with every time, especially, you know, sometimes a student joins in the senior year, they have about one semester it's worth of data, but that may be good data, but it's not publishable because it has not been confirmed yet. So like Dr. Sivi was alluding to previously, that planning is very important. So that knowledge transfer, we need to have this re a second student kind of shadowing in time so that it makes it uh, to, you know, to, the, to a paper and a peer reviewed uh, publication. So planning is very, very essential. And we got to keep our eyes and ears open for these good students who want to come into the lab early. For example, in my lab, I take students even uh, in their freshman year because I know they could have a big learning curve, but at least because of the time and the experience, right, that they get in the lab, by the time they hit the third year, they're almost like a second year graduate student. Now that's when we can accelerate. And sometimes I've even recruited high school students, seniors, and junior high school students who are in uh, kind of accelerated uh, programs in their school. And they have also kind of worked well to be some type of a buffer for that transfer of knowledge when I'm running out of an undergrad to transfer that information before the next undergraduate student can come in. And it is doable. Uh, one of my high schoolers is a published co-author and he's doing very well. Dr. Devadas, is that the student who's now at the University of Chicago? Yes, he, it is, Wilson Turner, yes. Okay, I, I remember him having a really productive uh, experience in your lab, that's great. Uh, Gowan, please tell us what else was on your group's mind. Well, I had one other question. We've mentioned several times the short time frame for these people in the lab. Um, I wonder if we could flip that problem on its head and actually say that's a benefit. You know, in a lot of sciences, we have replication issues where different users running the same test get wildly different results. And there are minute differences in the way that somebody might run a, run a test that can make a pretty strong difference in the result. Um, so maybe PUIs actually have an advantage in the ability to do some data science work here and in, in finding between user replicability for certain tests. Dr. So, would you mind commenting on that observation? 
I like your optimism in, in that. Um, so I, I agree that replicability is, is definitely an issue. Um, and I'll give you an example from my lab. I had this set of experiments. We were looking at you know, this particular catalyst to see how effective it was for a particular reaction. Um, and I had one student who was, you know, did maybe 50% of the work that I would need to have it published. Um, and then I had another student you know, I told them, okay, try and reproduce some of the results first, and then um, we can go ahead and you can complete the rest of the experiments. And it did, as you said, take him months in order to figure out what, you know, he was doing to try and reproduce the results. And in the end, we figured out that it was actually something that the new student was doing and that the previous student had been doing um, the procedure appropriately, so few, um, we could keep that particular data. But reproducibility is, is um, can and, is an issue. Um, on the downside, that can take longer because of the fact that, you know, now you have to get multiple students getting trained and making sure you're working out all those kinks. But on the other hand, you're right that the, um, if you do it right, if you're, you know, a really, uh, I guess, fastidious researcher, then you can actually have very high quality data with, with low error and not potentially have those issues. Excellent. Great. And at this point, I'd like to open it up to anyone who had an additional observation or question that arose from your breakout group discussions. Mala, I see that you had your hand up, but was that just a carryover from the original hand up, Mala? Yes, the second time. I'm sorry. No problem at all. All right. So, I think that that is sort of greasing the reels, wheels really well for where we can head next. And I'd like to um, invite the panelists to respond to some questions that I sent them in advance so that they've, they've had a time to at least preview some of those questions. And um, I won't necessarily, to warn the panelists, I won't necessarily go in the same order uh, that I listed the questions in the document that I sent you. Um, but I'd like to start with um, Dr. Solis, would you tell us a little bit about, um, for example, the typical composition of your research group, maybe averaged over the last few years, um, how many undergrads, how many graduate students, um, and maybe talk a little bit about how you go about um, recruiting research students, please. Oh, uh, Jeff, yeah, sure, be happy to. I'm also happy to get any tips <laughs> if you have ideas. Um, because even as even an an R one, uh, you know that was uh, challenging, um, and so the composition of my lab, the way I like to have it structured. So we do have a master's program in environmental science, and in biology. So I'm faculty in biology as well, but all or most of my students have gone through environmental science. So the structure that I like is to have you know um, a few graduate students and then a few um, undergraduates. The biggest my lab has ever been has been 11 students, uh, which was massive. And at that point, I had a, I was actually had a lab manager that helped um, kind of help with make all that work because that that is really a lot given all the demands that that we have. A more reasonable number, I think, for me is like two to three graduate students, and then you have maybe uh, two to four undergraduates and. You know, the undergrads are kind of working with the master students and me, um, and that, that sort of seems to work pretty well. Um, and, you know, the fewer students you have, the more effort and time you can put into it. Um, it just so happens that we had and have had several projects that, that needed, to get, uh, needed to get done, and so we needed folks to do them. Um, so, and then the way I go about recruiting Oh, so this is one huge advantage of actually a PUI, right? Some of my best master students, I recruited as undergraduates. Um, and by the time they're, they're in graduate school, they're already trained and, you know, being productive. Um, and that has worked phenomenally well. Um, so that's my favorite way to, to get students. Uh, I also advertise word of mouth. Um, and those are, those are pretty much it. Well, as a matter of fact, I just sent a message to all 
ENBS on environmental science undergrads. I was looking, I need some technician help um, with a project and, you know, a couple of my advisees. So that's another way, uh, either through teaching students or we do a lot of undergraduate advising. And if students express interests and apparent aptitude, that's a good way to recruit students. So a couple of my advisees that I really, really liked said, hey, I'm interested in this. And so that was an immediate, you know, yay kind of response by me. Um, so did I get all those? You did, yeah. And I think it, it, I, I echo all of those advantages to, to being at a PUI. I'm in close contact with several colleagues that are at similar career stages at R1 institutions, and they have expressed a lot of stress that goes into recruiting, particularly PhD students. It becomes a little bit of a game of roulette when you're making offers to PhD students and then you either, you, if you don't get them, then what happens? Because if you're gonna get tenure at an R1, you have to graduate. At least one PhD student is my understanding before you, you're going to be eligible for tenure. And so there's all sorts of pressure that goes into recruiting and it becomes expensive. PhD students are really expensive compared to undergraduates. Undergraduates are great because they're really inexpensive because we're not typically paying for their tuition or their health insurance or their fees. Um, Lots of good advantages to working, I think, with undergraduates. And I'll bounce this over to Dr. Devadas before inviting Dr. So to also comment on this question in terms of, uh, Dr. Devadas, tell us a little bit about the composition of your research group and, and what is your approach to recruiting? Because it seems to be, that's a real key, I think, to success, whether you're at a PUI or an, or an R1. As a faculty member, we're really only as good as our students when it comes to the, the, the productivity that they can have. Uh, Dr. Devadas, please. Uh, sure, thank you, Dr. Sivi. So, uh to the audience uh, members, pretty much it is, I echo the same sentiments of Dr. Silis and Dr. Sivi where we, um, I mean, I recruit my students. Uh, sometimes I get to know them uh, when I do uh, academic advising. And then uh, senior students look for uh, other junior students in the program and then they uh, advertise one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. Plus, in addition, I have spoken to faculty members, like for example, I asked Dr. Sivi in his analytical chemistry class, uh, do you recommend any student for research? So talk to your uh, colleagues, that's one way. And then sometimes I even recruit master students and for the master students, I talk to the uh, program directors or collaborators that I have either in the physics department or in the biology department. Uh, another way that I recruit is through my outreach events at, uh, this is for specifically for uh, high school students and middle school students. So then I uh, get them from their internship coordinators at uh, some of the local schools. So to go back uh, uh, to my first high school student from uh, Towson High, uh, Wilson Turner was excellent. So then he recruited another student to continue his project. So. The best way I have found um, uh, recruiting is through my own research students who can spread the word out and get students uh, into the lab. Uh, composition wise, I like I said, I have high schoolers, I have undergraduates as well as uh, fewer master's students. And once through a grant, I was able to uh, recruit a postdoctoral fellow, but that was a very rare uh, occasion. But on an average, I would say I have about seven to eight undergrads, three um, uh, graduate students. And pretty much my lab is, uh, uh, on an average, I would say combining all these three groups of uh, students would be around 15 students per semester. So my lab is a little bit exceptional where because of uh, additional funding that I was lucky to get, we kind of expanded the research program. And so I was able to uh, recruit the students. But bottom line is speaking to your colleagues, ask them if they have good students in their class, and then uh, spread the word out through your own uh, research students in your lab. Thank you, Dr. Devadas. I completely agree with the value of, of those recruiting strategies. And for the members of my group who have recruited people to come in after them, uh, they've always been successful, those students, when there's sort of been a recruiting that has gone on by the members of my group. Oftentimes, they have brought in better students than I could have otherwise found on my own. So I really value uh, that, that experience. And, and particularly because those students, if they've gone through a research experience in a laboratory, they know what it takes to be successful. They know what attributes um, 
a student would need to possess. And sometimes they've told me sort of very frankly that, uh, you know, Dr. Sivy, that particular student maybe wouldn't be a good choice for the type of work that's going on in your group. And I really appreciated their candor because um, it was ultimately sort of better for the group and for that student to not get involved in a situation that maybe wasn't right for them, or at least perhaps not right at that time um, for them. Uh, Dr. So, would you mind telling us about what recruiting looks like in your lab at Lafayette College? Sure, Lafayette is a little bit different in the fact that it is, there's no uh, graduate program at all. So we don't have master's students, we're completely undergraduate. Um, so that means that all the training and all and everything um, happens basically through me, or if I'm good at planning, um, then it can, I can rely on some of my seniors to train the juniors and sophomores and, and the like. Um, so my recruiting strategy um, will, uh, actually I rely a lot on students being motivated themselves. I'm very lucky in the fact that Lafayette students are very motivated and a lot of them come in and go specifically to Lafayette because they know that they're going to be able to work firsthand with faculty members. And so it's not uncommon that I'll get a first year student come to me and be like, hey, how do I get in the lab? Right? And um, often what I'll do with those students is um, I'm a little bit wary of having, you know, you know, completely brand new first years come in and work in the lab. So I usually have them shadow my current students. Um, for a semester or two and then if they're interested and I talked to the students that they were shadowing to and said they're not going to like you know completely up in the, the lab or anything then um, I'll often you know ask them to come join the group in, in the summer or the like of course uh, funding and everything dependent. Um, another mechanism that we use is uh, we do brown bags uh, so lunchtime kind of talks um, every semester where we basically introduce all of the faculty in the in our chemical engineering department and we do just a little bit you know two to five minutes of this is the research that's going on in our lab and these are the potential openings that i might have in our lab and then students who are potentially interested in research can go to those say oh what is research let me learn more about it let me figure out what the different faculty are doing and then they can approach the different faculty um, or even multiple faculty to that they're interested in and then you know say figure out what's the right fit so usually i have much more interest um, than i potentially actually have space for um, because i'm the only one there and um, i don't have any master students or the like i the largest my lab has ever been is six students which was really a lot for, <laughs> for me um, i usually like to be somewhere like three or four or so um, the whole pandemic has kind of thrown a wrench in my my planning because i've let students graduate without training anyone because of the fact that you know i'm not currently having a lot of people in my lab right now um, but that's the general re recruiting strategy um, for, you know, what my, my, my thinking has been um, along with kind of what has already been, been discussed. Great. Thank you very much. And just to help calibrate folks in terms of typical sizes of research groups, at least in my experience working with folks at Towson and other similarly situated places, on the low end, I've seen very successful groups routinely have just two students at a time. I think of one of my colleagues who's a synthetic organic chemist who physically has to be in the lab because it's so technique driven and so sort of safety conscious for the types of work that those students are doing in that synthetic organic chemistry lab that that colleague really needs to be present and that colleague's been really successful with typically just two students at a time because of the need to be in the lab physically present so you'll want to think if you're designing a research program um, for undergraduates you'll want to keep in mind like how much of your time and your attention will need to be sort of having that physical presence in the lab and how much can occur without you being physically present and also those sort of safety considerations if you're an experimental science. Um, I want to um, catch up on some of the questions. Excellent questions are coming in in the chat, so we're going to start going through some of those questions next. Um, I'll just share that in my research group, I over the last few years, I've averaged somewhere between six and eight students. Um, probably a comfortable number for me would be closer to the five or six in terms of my bandwidth and the types of projects that are going on in my lab, but as the blessing and the curse of, of writing grant proposals, if they get funded, then you have to do it. Um, and so you, you, you end up recruiting people and, and um, uh, it, it ends up being really exciting though at the same time. It's a nice problem to have, uh, to, to have a group end up being a little bit bigger than you anticipated. Um, and I'll say in terms of recruiting, one of the strategies I use um, 
at my institution as a full-time faculty member, I have access to a database of all the students with really advanced search features. So I can tell the faculty database, show me all students who are, for example, at least sophomores with at least this particular GPA, who've gotten this particular grade in analytical chemistry, and all sorts of search tools that can then show me the names of students. And I've done some recruiting that way where I've just sent blind emails to these students who seem to be at a good spot. Maybe they're a sophomore, uh, got good grades in some of the prerequisite courses that would be a good skill set for the research that goes on in my lab. And then I just contact them and say, hey, have you thought about research um, and what that might look like? And I don't necessarily tell them in advance that I have a spot for them, um, but I'm happy to help just inform them of opportunities that I know exist in my lab and other places because a number of students um, at, at colleges uh, like Towson um, that are large uh, uh, institutions with a very diverse population of students, including a lot of transfer students from community colleges, a lot of undergrads at Towson, for example, don't even have it on their radar that research is a thing that undergraduates can participate in. And so just educating students toward that end can go a long way. Okay, so let's go to the chat questions. Nathan asks, do research responsibilities change pre and post tenure at PUIs? And so I'll bounce this to Dr. Solis, um, who has been on both sides of the tenure uh, uh, mark. Uh, what do you, what are you, what are your thoughts on that, Dr. Solis? So I guess you know, I don't know. I, my my, pers my my the short answer is I don't think so. Um, your perceived the perceived pressure is different, right? Because you know until you get tenure, there's always that concern that you won't get it. Or this is and I you know this is my view. Um, so having said that, you know I've looked back and and one of the really good pieces of advice I got from a, my first faculty mentor was, you know, he didn't worry about that. He was more interested in what he called portable tenure, meaning, you know, he wanted to perform at a level that he didn't, you know, that he could, he would be competitive kind of anywhere. And, and by anywhere, you know, you have to, you have to be within reason. If you're in the PUI realm, then it's harder to be competitive with the scholarly output of someone in R1. But within that range, you know, that was kind of her his perspective and i sort of have i sort of have kept that so my my responsibilities haven't really changed they may have even increased in terms of you know what the longer you're in the field the kind of more opportunities um i think present themselves um and the more opportunities that you have and i've always again kind of been mostly interested in that you know kind of making sure that my, in doing scholarship at a level that's satisfying to me but i think that is you know reasonably productive if it were at any institution in the sim similar kind of you know designation um but again to go back the perce the perception definitely changes because you de there is a sigh of relief when once you get tenure even if you know you there's nothing to indicate that you wouldn't get it still so yeah and I think tenure, just to build upon what Dr. Salee said, tenure can give you the opportunity to go after some perhaps riskier projects, whereas pre-tenure, some of the good advice I was given was go after that low-hanging fruit, something that can get you a publication with an undergrad's name on it is sort of, at least at my institution, my sense is this is true at many PUIs, that's the gold standard for what, what tenure and promotion committees are looking for for assistant professors is are you publishing with undergraduates. And if you are and have a track record of that, it's gonna be really difficult for a promotion and tenure committee to say that you're not meeting the expectations of, of the, the, the scholarship component. Um, different PUIs have different expectations with regard to grants and success in writing grant proposals. Maybe I'll, I'll hold off on commenting on that um, for a little while. Um, but having, I, I'm currently the chairperson of my college's promotion and tenure committee. And one of the things that I will say at that sort of pre-tenure versus post-tenure process that jumped out to our committee is trends. So one of the red flags that can happen um, would be if uh, a faculty member gets promoted to associate professor with tenure and then their research productivity takes a dive. 
And that makes it more difficult, I would say, in some instances for that faculty member to then get promoted to full professor because the expectation of most administrations is that you're going to be at a trajectory when you get tenure to continue to sustain a reasonably high level of research productivity if your goal is to get full professor um, at that institution. The next question in the chat is, would there be an expectation for graduating a certain number of MS students for achieving tenure at a PUI? Dr. Davidas, did you want to take, uh, take on that? You, you recently completed a dossier for promotion to associate professor in tenure. True. Uh, I think uh, there is no hard and fast rule unless your university or the program specifies that you need to be uh, graduating a certain number of students. As far as my understanding goes, correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Sivi or Dr. Silis, uh, in your program, do you have a requirement that uh, your faculty uh, in the environmental science master's program, is that a specific number? I doubt that, right? A specific number of- Of I'm master's sorry. students to graduate uh, in order for the faculty member to receive tenure? Uh, well, so, okay, so just to, just to clarify, so environmental science is interdisciplinary, so my tenure home is in biology. Oh, okay. So it would, they would kind of, they would, biology would evaluate that, and I don't, there is no set number that I have seen with regard to anything. Only, it's kind of, you know, as, as John indicated, if you have grant funding and have published with an undergraduate student or a master's student, that's you're you're on a good trajectory, um, but there is no no set number. No, uh -uh. and yes. as Thank and you. as, Thank as you. Dr. So mentioned too, there's many PUIs that don't have the option to publish right. with the master's students too. So that's another thing that uh, to, to keep in mind. But uh, Dr. Davidas, did you have further thoughts on that question? Right, as, as long as you don't uh, keep that master students forever, then there's a problem. You know, <laughs> make sure that they graduate on time or in a decent time and not hold them back from moving forward. I think that would be uh, what a te a, the tenure committee would look for. Thank you very much, Dr. Devadas. The next question in the chat, really good questions coming in through the chat, at least uh, from, from Gowan, at least in engineering, most R1 professors are essentially part-time consultants, even if they don't want to admit it. They do a ton of research that strongly crosses over towards professional engineering consulting. Does this trend carry over to PUIs as well? And so I'll bounce this to the engineering faculty member on the panel, Dr. So. Uh, at uh, Lafayette, do the faculty members in engineering participate in any consulting? And if so, how does that inform or overlap the scholarship that they're doing for their tenure and pr promotion dossiers? Um. To start, I actually want to push back a little bit on the on you know you know engineering research or research even at a at a R one being uh, like a consultant like thing. I think there are projects that you work very hand in hand, maybe with a company or the like, to help further that. Um, but I think the big difference between being academia and you know trying to do industrial research is the fact that you're actually trying to probe deeper. You're trying to understand more fundamentals. Um, and that's definitely what the NSF is looking for. Um, and so I wouldn't say that um, you know being a high-end consultant is is what the research is like in in um, a lot of or most of engineering research to to, to that extent. Um, however. You're right that um, faculty members can act as consultants, absolutely, and sometimes they can get paid to act as consultants. Um, it is not a requirement in engineering to do that, and I think different fields, it is more common than other fields, right? So, for example, I feel like in civil engineering, it's probably more common than in chemical engineering for academics to act as consultants on, on particular on particular projects. I have seen some of my colleagues at Lafayette do that. Um, so, you know, doing part of their scholarship is acting and consulting. And sometimes you can actually um, reach an agreement with whoever you're doing the actual formal consulting with to publish that sometimes, um, and sometimes not. Um, and it depends on your promotion and tenure committee whether or not the consulting is actually something that can move towards your tenure or not. And that's where I think it can become really helpful to have conversations with senior faculty members in your department, particularly if you're assigned to senior faculty as a mentor, to get their input before you might dive in as an assistant professor into a consulting type project to see exactly how that might uh, be interpreted by folks who are going to make decisions on promotion and tenure. 
Walla asked, how often do you run into students that are not very serious? I worry about this thinking about undergraduate research. Dr. Devadas, would you mind, since you have a history at Towson of being very successful in running a large lab with uh, many students to, to keep track of Dr. Devadas, of many days I don't know how you do it, um, and I continue to be impressed at the work that you do, but could you talk about what some of the challenges are for students? Because uh, obviously not every student is going to come in with the absolute highest level of seriousness that we might want, but, but how do you respond to that, Dr. Devadas, and are there things that a faculty member can do to help inspire excellence in those students who might be not performing at their potential? True. Uh, uh, I mean, I have encountered quite a few of those students. Uh, uh, the reason, we, uh, I mean, I don't blame them uh, uh, at the outset. The reason that they, they're not serious, I feel, is because they don't understand what peer-reviewed research entails. So they come with that opinion. So sometimes I have tried to uh, sit them down and speak to them and uh, reiterate the expectations as, uh, that I expect from them as a researcher in the lab. Sometimes, or most of the time, that works. And you'll be surprised that, you know, uh, in rare occasions, your 4.0 GPA students are not your best researchers because they cannot uh, deal with failure. And uh, one of the shortcuts that kind of uh, sneaky, I would call it, that I have learned is to recruit these high impact high school students. So when they come in and do this research, then the undergrads open their eyes and then they see, okay, if a high school researcher can achieve this uh, type and intensity of research and productivity, I can do it. So sometimes inspiration comes from within them uh, in the surroundings, right? And the other students that are uh, beside them who are productive. And sometimes it doesn't work. And then when it really doesn't work, you uh, because you know money doesn't come free, uh, research grants are not easy to uh, get. So in order to save resources, then you have to tell the student this is not working out. Um, I've sometimes told them to take a semester off, figure out what they want to do, and also, and then one or two students have come back and have been really productive. Some of them have come back as uh, master students and completed uh, their uh, research with me after taking that uh, semester or a real year long break even. Thank you, Dr. Devadas. Really helpful things to think about because um, as, as PhD students and postdocs, one of the things that most of us aren't trained in is how to do group management and how to basically, you know, get your MBA uh, at the same time as, as learning how to be an independent researcher. And so a lot of this you sort of have to learn as you go through experience, but then also through, through forms like this, where we get to hear what works well for other people. Um, and so one of the things that um, I've encountered uh, with regard to um, students who are perhaps underperforming um, is, as Dr. Devadas mentioned, to, to help those students make a choice and make course corrections and, and giving them regular feedback on how they're doing. Because I've noticed that um, students, especially if they're new research students, they don't necessarily know what the bar is. And depending on the project, you as the PI might not actually know what the bar is because in terms of like how quickly should data come in, I have a good sense of what I want the quality of the data to look like and this type of thing. But but being really above board in terms of what the expectation is. And um, in my group, when I'm doing recruiting, before I'll bring somebody in my lab, I'll routinely assign them a previous publication from my group to read. And then we'll have a meeting and I'll just ask them, questions about the paper, you know, what was their impression, were there questions that they had, and that really helps you gauge both the, the applicant's ability to assimilate that type of information, and also, but it also gauges their enthusiasm for that topic area, where enthusiasm can cover over a lot of sins, as it turns out when it comes to the research process. Um, one of the other questions that came up on the chat is, do your research groups hold regular group meetings like those that are common in R1 research groups? Um, Dr. Solis, did you want to take that? Sure. Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, so I have weekly, it depends on the size of my group, but I'll have a, usually a weekly group meeting or sometimes it's biweekly if it's a really tough semester. 
And then I try to meet with every student every couple individually every couple of weeks as well. Um, so that, yeah, I ran it the same way at, at Texas Tech and I feel that that, you know, at the very minimum, you need that connection. And, you know, I, I try to visit the labs as well while students are there, but at the same time, I do rely on my graduate students to kind of um, have a lot of autonomy and, and to help mentor uh, undergrads. But yeah, so yes, definitely. Great. One of the outgrowths of the pandemic last year that, that my group started to do is intramural group meetings with an R1 institution where another, so I'm an environmental chemistry research lab, and I've been uh, collaborating with an environmental chemist at the University of Southern California, and about once every other month, we'll have a joint group meeting through the, the magic of Zoom and have the undergraduates in my group interact with the PhD students and postdocs at that R1 institution. We'll either do a paper discussion or we'll have one member from each group present a, a short research presentation. And that sort of cross-institutional uh, collaboration, that approach to group meetings has been really beneficial, uh, I think, and has opened my eyes and hopefully the eyes of, of the members of our groups to be able to see what life might look like after undergrad too, because one of the ma my main motivations was to help students to, to see what, what opportunities could await them after um, undergraduate. Um, Dr. So, I'd, I'd like you to take this next question if you would. Um, Mwala asks, do you have GPA requirements for students that work in your labs and do you have to suspend them from lab if they uh, undergo any financial or judicial trouble? Um, so I don't officially have a GPA requirement for the students in my labs. However, um, one of the ways that I can fund students is Lafayette actually has an, what they call an Excel Scholars program. And um, so they are willing to fund a student over you know, this, the summer or the academic year and provide them housing. And so in order for the student to qualify for that program, they need a minimum GPA of, I believe it's 3.2 or 3.25. Um, so typically, though, the students that are you know, interested in research, they do tend to have a high a higher GPA, so it's typically not really a problem at all. Um, and I, you know, I talk to the students, and depending on what their motivations are, a lot of them want to go to grad school. You know, I say, you know, you probably need to have a, you know, a pretty decent GPA. I talk to them about that in their plans going to graduate school. And even if they're not going to graduate school, if, if they have you know, desires to get a particular GPA, and I think that research is actually taking away from their ability to perform in their academics, then, you know, I say, we want to reweigh the amount of time that you're spending in lab, or do you want to take a semester off of research to focus on your, on your academics, um, and then come back. Um, so that's, you know, ways to kind of mitigate that. Um, I don't, mm, I haven't had any issues with students having an undergone financial, or are you talking about traditional in terms of, you know, like, um, Academic. Yeah, like things that you don't really worry about with graduate students that you might with like an undergrad, like there was alcohol in their dorm room and then now they have a judicial for that. Like, do, yeah. do you punish them in lab, not punish, but like, you know, are there reprimands like in their lab life too, or, you know? I think, I mean, if they get suspended from the school, they would be suspended from the lab as well. So if they, you know, suspended as a student, I believe that would, that would translate the, the same way. I, I wouldn't be able to keep them. Um, officially <laughs> and my sense is at least at Towson that that is exceedingly rare for students who are involved in research to be they, they tend to be self-selective to a certain extent that the, the the type of students who are pretty responsible I think socially responsible which is exactly the the, the type of people that you'd want to have working for you uh, Gowan asks having worked in a commercial lab I've noticed that lab safety at universities can be quite lax how have the panelists addressed lab safety given high turnover and inexperienced personnel terrific question especially as I'm coming off of a three-year term as the um, safety czar for my department um, it, it can be a real challenge I think and but you as a PI one of the things that I found really helpful is just having physical presence in the lab space, even though most of the research that goes on in my lab involves chemicals no more harmful than bleach and water. Um, but at the same time, still having a physical presence and including conversations in things like group meetings and 
group emails, just reminders. Here's today's safety point of emphasis. I, I like to sort of roll out uh, to folks. And then just being uh, uh, willing to enforce the standards that you have for your lab uh, for safety. And I try to make it a point in my lab that we exceed the minimum expectations for safety that the university um, puts on us. Um, Dr. Davidas, would you comment on, on how that approach to safety culture works in your laboratory? Uh, in addition to what Dr. Sivi said, the way I kind of emphasize uh, uh, lab safety is by subdividing my groups into tinier groups and having leaders. So we work in multiple rooms. So each room I have a group leader, meaning one of the undergraduate students or graduate students who are in charge. In addition to my physical presence and making like spot visits and uh, making sure that they're all wearing their goggles and that they are um, uh, uh, wearing the uh, correct attire. And if I find a research student, however senior or junior they are, I have them leave the lab right away uh, and leave for the day or go to the dorm, change and come back. So you have to be uh, strict about that. When you see the first infraction, you've got to uh, say that. And I tell my students, third infraction and they will be leaving the group. So uh, I, have, I haven't had to send anybody out of the lab uh, where they kind of repeatedly did the same uh, error over and over again. One hard talk, and I don't mince my words, I tell them directly, this is the consequence, uh, but if you like it, stay, if not, you have to leave, that's it. Because safety is paramount, we, and we can't afford to have any accidents in the lab, because it's not, I mean, both from a scientific perspective as well as from a uh, humanitarian perspective. We do not want any of you to get injured, any of our students to get injured. So uh, we take that seriously. Uh, so at least that's how it happens in our lab, in our department. And Dr. Sivi used to do his spot checks uh, rounding the labs. I remember last year and the year before when he was in charge. So other than the PI, we have the safety coordinators in the department that, they, uh, that do their job seriously. One of the things I also do, so at Towson, students who are enrolled in research, uh, undergraduates who are enrolled in, in research courses, which would typically be how students get academic credit for their research in the fall and the spring semester, um, I include in the rubric, because at Towson, in the chemistry department, the students get a letter grade each semester for their research um, work. And I include in the syllabus, uh, as a part of my grading rubric, grades for lab safety and adherence to lab safety. And the vast majority of the time that has a positive impact on the student's grades. But there have been a couple of instances where that has caused a student's research grade uh, to drop. And um, it, very commonly I'm used to handing out like A's and A minuses for research kind of, kind of grades. But um, I, I really do drop the hammer when it comes to, especially repeated offenses when it comes to, uh, to, to safety incidents, which again, thankfully are rare. But it really starts at the top as the PI of you setting the tone for the safety culture in your lab. You, if you uh, have a certain rule, you need to follow that rule as the PI in the lab. You don't get an exception. If you're asking your students to do something, you should be modeling that behavior uh, in the lab. The next question on the chat says, um, I suppose that summer would be the most productive time for undergraduates at research. How do you balance this with students wanting to do summer REUs at R1s or, or internships? Um, Dr. So, would you speak to that, please? Absolutely. Um, so in engineering, especially the junior, the summer after the junior year is the time where a lot of students love to go get internships um, and also apply for REUs. So you're absolutely right that one, that summer is the most productive in terms of research time, and two, I may lose students to those experiences. However, it's for the best of the student. If they want to get another experience, if they want to have another mentor, they want to check out what an internship is like, I'm all 100% behind them because I think that's important for, for them. In terms of the actual lab productivity, how do I balance that? Um, well, I try to get students who are um, often in 
I will often try and get them after their first year if they're, you know, a, a, an excellent student, or definitely after their sophomore year is when I like to have students start. Um, so you have the students over that particular summer. Sometimes they'll work over the academic year and really get good in the lab. And if they take the junior summer off, you know, that's okay. And many of them will come back and do an honors thesis in my lab after that. And I find that during the honors thesis period is when students are actually um, exceedingly productive. And sometimes, you know, having had experiences outside, they can actually, you know, come in and be like, oh, okay, this is why we do things. They, they have a different perspective and, and, and become a little bit, you know, even, even better or have a new way of thinking about things. And that tends to, to improve productivity. Thank you very much. And Dr. Solis, I'd like you to field this next question. Um, as a faculty member who's been very successful in securing extramural funding, um, both at an R1 and now at, uh, at Towson, what types of funding opportunities exist for folks who are working at PUIs or non-doctoral granting institutions? Uh, so this, this was actually a multi-part question, but let's just start with that first part, if you would, Dr. Solis. So um, I think that there are, are several. So for one, Towson, and I'm part of the undergraduate research committee. So Towson University, and I think a lot of other uh, PUIs have grants or small grants, small research, you know, pots of funding for students to apply for so that undergraduate research can be supported. Um, so that, so that, you know, I didn't have that at Texas Tech, for example. Um, there are also, and we have kind of larger pools of money, same thing, that are internal. Um, but are, are kind of geared toward the integration, at least in Fisher College uh, of Math and Science, of, you know, scholarship and um, teaching. So, you know, getting, getting students involved in research. Um, and those can be, you know, reasonably sized. Like, I think I've had one or two for 20 grand or something like that in collaboration with others. And, you know, we're able to pay students. Uh, so, you know, over the summer, because that's, to get back to the previous question, that's one way that you know, I think helps to retain students. If you have research funding and you can pay them over the summer, then that's an incentive uh, for them to stay. Um, but I also agree with Dr. So that, you know, in general, I always encourage students to get more experiences elsewhere because that's part of the enriching experience. Um, the other thing is that, you know, Towson, as an example, really does stand behind those broader impacts um, that grant granting agencies like NSF, for example, are, are really getting behind as well. So, you know, it, it has this perfect infrastructure for that, for, to, to, to really have a broader impact because we're, we're reaching a, a wider diversity of students um, that are generally, you know, younger than they would be, say, you know, if they were in grad school. So in a way, even though it's the same pot, um, I think that there are some advantages of being with at a PUI in that instance. And then the, the last one is, has to do with connections to the community. So we have a lot of students that are uh, in Maryland, you know, from Maryland, um, and, you know, we're building relationships with folks in Maryland. So whether they're consulting firms or state agencies, and that has been a pretty fruitful avenue of funding. Um, and part of that is because Maryland, and one of the reasons I wanted to come back, is a very kind of environmental state, if you will. Uh, and so there are more opportunities. But having our students go to meetings, like, you know, we have a water quality uh, council meeting that's local, um, and they interact with Maryland Department of the Environment, those folks, all those things, uh, you know, lead to kind of opportunities um, for us. So. Thank you very much, Dr. Solis. And uh, just to piggyback on that, funding agencies like the National Science Foundation, depending on the directorate that you might be applying for a grant funding from as a professor, some of them have separate pots of money for research at undergraduate institutions or RUI designations. Some of the other directorates um, will allow you to put that label on your grant, but the program directors, if you ask them, will say, you can put that label on there, but we don't have a separate pot of money and you'll still be competing with everybody for those but I've actually not found that to be a disadvantage because uh, the, the the funding that my group so my group has secured I think four now NSF grants and um, I've never checked that 
box or ask for that separate part of money that comes from an R that was specific to RUIs in part because for several of the programs that I was applying to, they didn't have that separate pot of money. But in the narrative of your project description, you can talk about how undergraduates are going to be involved in that project and these review panels who admittedly are primarily composed of people, of faculty members from R1 institutions. I remember sitting on a review panel for NSF where we were trying to decide who to recommend for funding. I was the only person out of 15 in that panel from a PUI. Um, and, but the flip side of that is when proposals came in from a PUI, guess where all of the eyes in the room looked? They looked at me and said, okay, Sivi, what do you think about this, this particular proposal? Um, but I found that in my experiences, panel or grant proposal reviewers from R1s are favorably disposed to research coming from primarily undergraduate institutions, in part because they don't view you as a threat. You're not, in, in, at an R1, you're not going to go after the super sexy, you know, necessarily the nature paper that they're trying to get out. So they're kind of rooting for you and not necessarily just in a, oh, that's cute. They're trying to do science at a PUI manner. It's, it's, it's more than that, right? Because they know that if, if really good undergraduate training happens, then that makes their PhD students better. They want PUIs to be successful because you are making their graduate students and, and better for them. Um, and so that is to say, reach out to these program directors at these funding agencies, um, ask for a Zoom meeting, get some face time with these program directors so that they get to know what your interests are and that they can give you feedback. They'll often be really candid about what projects you might be proposing. Um, but the number one hurdle in my experience to getting things funded as a faculty member to PUI is feasibility. The panel wants to know, can the science that you're proposing be done with the resources and the personnel at a PUI? And if you can convince the panel of that, you're going to go a long way to getting recommended for funding. And so um, one of the ways that I, that in my own career that, that has proven really beneficial is I really prioritize getting a paper out early in my career with undergraduates as co-authors so that when my subsequent grant proposals were reviewed and they're saying, can this person, this professor, this new professor turn out science and turn it into a publication that has undergraduate co-authors, I already had the evidence to say that, yes, that was in fact um, true. The second part to this question, I want to bounce to Dr. Devidas. Do PUIs typically offer a starting research budget or startup funds for new tenure track faculty members? Yes, the answer to that question is yes. Uh, and uh, the range or the amount that you negotiate as part of your startup depends on the uh, institution. So uh, I am lucky, one of the lucky people here at Towson University, Towson University although as a PUI, uh, they kind of give a larger startup compared to maybe smaller uh, PUIs or liberal arts colleges. So the short answer is yes, they give you a startup and they might have a little wiggle room to where you can negotiate with them. Let's say they say uh, the starting uh, data, they offer you $50,000 as your startup. They might have a little wiggle room in these institutions to go up by say $10,000, but uh, it again, varies from institution to institution. And when you are doing this uh, negotiations with the people who are, with the people who are hiring you, do not hesitate to bargain because that is your only chance, the one and only chance for you to get, um, uh, try and get all that you want to get your uh, research program started. So do not feel shy. That doesn't mean if they are offering you 50, you go and ask them for 100,000. I'm just telling you that. So uh, plus or minus 10,000, right, would be a good idea, but keep, your, uh, keep a list of things that you would need, an Excel spreadsheet, before you begin these negotiations with a list of things that you need, so that when you are given the offer letter, you already have planned and know exactly what you need at a minimum for the first three years of your research program before you can begin, uh, you know, I wouldn't say before you begin, you can't start writing for, writing grants as soon as you have enough data to substantiate and ask for uh, funding money. But 
just to keep yourself safe for that three years, you build in a cushion, right? A cushion, uh, a sizable amount that you can use to get that first or second publication. So you're safe for tenure, as well as uh, like what Dr. CV said, you have evidence when writing grants that you can produce results. And just to build on what Dr. Devadas was saying, and this is true, I think, regardless of where you end up after graduate school, whether it's an R1, a PUI, industry, government is a little bit trickier, but um, be willing to have that awkward five minute conversation in which you ask for more, because as Dr. Devadas pointed out, that could be your last chance for a long time to ask for more. And so it, also keep in mind, you're likely gonna be negotiating with a department chairperson or a dean or something of that nature. It's not their money. It is not coming out of their pocket. It might be coming out of their budget, but it is not, they're still gonna be able to feed their family. So ask them for what you need, but be in a position to be able to justify that. And if you explain how that's gonna benefit their institution to invest in you at a level that is commensurate with the type of work you wanna do, you're gonna make it hard for them to say no. And actually just by asking, even if they tell you no, you win. And here's why, it, psychologically, personnel managers don't like to say no over and over and over again to the same person. They start to feel bad. And so that can help you accrue political capital within that administration to say, okay, you told me no last time, and I'm gonna ask you again for something here coming up soon, and my likelihood of you getting a yes out of you is gonna go up because you told me no last time. To add one point to the female uh, students in the audience, I don't know if Dr. So will agree with me. I just want to pass on what information I actually got at one of uh, my uh, workshops that I went to as a student is that they told us that females do not negotiate, female scientists. So they emphasize that uh, the female students in the audience, and I want to uh, reiterate that to you girls out there, do not hesitate to negotiate. Negotiate, negotiate. Uh, the startup as well as your salary. Dr. So, did you have anything that you'd like to add to that question or the, the, the discussion that's ongoing? Um, I will comment, I guess, on Dr. Devin's last comment. Um, I, I, I think it's definitely true. Um, I, uh, I, just based on the literature, based on the what's been out there, it, it is definitely shown that, that women tend to not negotiate as much. So don't be afraid to negotiate. I was afraid to negotiate, but um, I was given I, what I thought was a comfortable startup amount. Um, startup amounts do definitely vary. There was, um, in my field recently, I think a bunch of PUI, um, someone from a PUI had basically um, gotten the average startups for all of the different institutions and they vary um, really widely in the institution and so make sure that when you go somewhere that you're at least if you don't have the resources let's say the instruments or whatever that they're already and access to them that you have the startup that you would need in order to to, to get that um, and of course i'm just specifying that this is particularly true in engineering and the, and the natural sciences. Um, many, like in the humanities, there's often not a startup. So that's just to be clear that this is pertaining to, to those fields. And Dr. So you touched on a really important point, which has to do with already existing infrastructure. And I'll give you just an example from my laboratory. We rely quite a bit on high performance liquid chromatography and gas chromatography and mass spectrometry. And Towson um, already had the vast majority of those instruments in place. And so, whereas if I were at an R1 institution, it would, it's in pretty common for PIs to basically have their own versions in their lab of those instruments. But at PUIs, the model of sort of community instruments or shared instrument resources is much more common. And that allowed my startup to go a lot further, even though my startup was a lot smaller than a startup at an R1 institution. The fact that I didn't have to buy my own GC or HPLC saved a lot of money. And there's an additional advantage to that, to figuring out what are the shared instruments that you'll have access to because at least at Towson, and my sense is this is true at a lot of PUIs, I don't even have to pay for instrument time 
Whereas at an R1, if there are shared instruments, you're probably paying a fee per hour to use that instrument. But it, it even gets better at a PUI. I typically don't even have to pay for repairs on that instrument because when it breaks, even though if my group is 80% of the use of that instrument and maybe only 20% is other groups or maybe for a teaching lab application, when it breaks, I go to my chair and say, this department instrument just broke. You need to fix it or pay to have it fixed. I'm not going to pay for that. And Towson is actually really good about our department chairs and our dean saying, okay, we'll fix it. Um, so it's all of these sort of hidden savings that are worth investigating um, at a PUI. Um, and the very last part of that question was, is there a difference in departmental funding available as well? I think Dr. So spoke to that, uh, that yes, from one department to another, there can be pretty big differences um, in what that looks like uh, from one department to another. The, the next, the questions keep rolling in in the chat, which is great. Keep them coming, folks. Um, is it a good idea to make learning a learning goals document for research projects for new students in the lab. I think it would give them some structure, especially in their first semester in the lab, but I suspect that it might set false expectations in that it will not prepare students for the uncertainty inherent in research. Um, it would be great to hear your input in terms of what type of documentation or background information or, or to, to use uh, the term here, learning goals document are provided to the students. Um, Dr. Solis, would you like to, to take that one on in terms of what, what, what do you hand a new researcher in terms of getting them on their feet in the lab? So that's an interesting question. Um, so basically what I do is I, they, I don't start a student with, um, you know, here's what your, this is your question or, or like that. They, they start shadowing other students and working with me and then and then we have conversations about what the goals of the overall overall research program or project might be and then what i expect them to do is to if they're if they're doing independent research sometimes i have students in my lab that are just helping as technicians um, and then there are there are students that may be getting credit or they have an eye on graduate school and they want a more independent type project in that case then my expectation is for them to sort of develop an objective slash hypothesis you know and then and this we work kind of back and forth um that's related to you know what it is that they want to do how they're going to do it and what the expected outcome is going to be so and i mean i think that i haven't had issues with regard to the uncertainty of research uh having an impact on you know the student's perspective or their their success i feel you know we work a lot with animals which are very variable um, and so I think that most students have a pretty good sense that, you know, sometimes it doesn't go as planned. Um, so that hasn't really been an issue, but that, but that other part is really important, right? The, the kind of overall project, the context and having them kind of develop, you know, objectives and hypotheses related to that. I think that that's an important part of grow of the growth of the student. Um, and also an important element for that independent kind of research project um, credit, kind of, if you will. Um, I think that's, yeah, so that's what we do. Hope that's clear. Great. Thank you very much, Dr. Solis. Um, Dr. Devadas, did you want to speak to that in terms of how do you get new students sort of up and running in your laboratory? Uh, Pretty much in this in a similar fashion. So, uh, like Dr. Sully said, sometimes students are enrolled uh, for research credits. So, in such a case, they I hand them the syllabus. Uh, you know, this is what you have to do. And uh, 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 my syllabus is actually expanded upon uh, what actually Dr. Sivi handed to me when I was a first year faculty member, and then with uh, every student who goes through and if i encounter a problem you know unfortunately the syllabus kind of keeps on expanding with that situation or that scenario and then that features into uh, the grade for example one uh, one, uh, one category that i added was how does a student react to crit critique so when we uh, give critique to students some students can handle it and some cannot so when i put that out there not that i'm going to be you know very specific about it but then 
the criteria that I put in there is more for the students to kind of think, okay, I am being assessed on all of these things. Another thing that I repeatedly tell my students and there are some of my old students, of, uh, I mean, senior students may have heard it at least twice in a year is I emphasize to my students when you come in, uh, whatever grade they are, uh, whether high schooler or undergraduate student or master students, as part of my mentoring, when I meet with them one on one or during our group meetings and uh, I wait for teaching moments where I explain to them when they do something in the lab, I tell them, see, now this is what I am going to reflect tomorrow in your recommendation letter when you ask me. So I, I, and I tell them the easiest of recommendation letters uh, for me to write tomorrow are the are for are, are for the students who have been spectacular or done more than what is the baseline expectation from them. So then I give them examples. Okay, today you made this manual. So I'm going to be like, okay, this student so-and-so uh, wrote this uh, standard operating procedure. So then the students begin to think, okay, what can I do? And I see that that has helped them improve as a researcher because they're also thinking in, in terms of their future, what they want to do, whether they want to go into graduate school or go into industry. So based on the type of students, uh, uh, whether they are in uh, uh, registered in the class, then I go with the syllabus. If it is students who are volunteering and are doing research for multiple semesters, I still show them what the grading uh, uh, scheme is for actual students registered and tell them this is what so you got to keep as a guideline because tomorrow at the end of the day, if you're asking me for a recommendation, this is what is going to uh, go into that letter. Thank you very much, Dr. Davidas. And just some brief insights from, from my laboratory. I sort of, when I start a new research student in my group, I try to put the scientific method, I, I invert it. And I normally have new research students not start with method development. So again, I'm an environmental analytical chemist. And whenever possible, I try to help new undergraduate students get to the point where they're collecting publication quality data as quickly as possible. And in my lab, what that normally does not look like is having them start with method development. I normally try to hand a new student a method that a more senior student has already validated or that I've already validated myself and have them run experiments to just collect data. Data tends to be a really good motivator. Um, students, under, in my experience, undergraduates who spend a lot of time with method development um, don't have as much sort of return on their investment and it can, t can hurt their motivation. And so the quicker you can get a student to, to good data collection, in my experience, um, the better. Um, Dr. So, did you want to speak to how uh, that works in your lab in terms of how you get new research students up and running? Sure. Um, so I can, think it can really, it can depend on how, like their motivation for doing research, right? I think you've talked extensively about how, you know, if you were doing research for credit, how that would work. It's pretty clear there's a syllabus. At Lafayette, Lafayette, we have a proposal that they have to put in at the beginning of that of that class, right? And so they basically have to develop goals on their own. Um, in terms of, especially in the summer, summer can be a lot more free form. They have a lot more time to work on the research. Um, I expect them to read literature and, and the like. What I have found is not having a syllabus per se, because I don't want them to feel like it's a class, um, but having a document that basically said, these are kind of your overall goals. Um, you might not get to all of them, right? Because, um, you know, research is, is um, you know, tends to have a mind of its own. Um, but these are kind of the goals. And some of the goals are things like, you know, reading and learning how to, you know, interpret literature, right? And writing um, like a mini literature review. And another goal might be troubleshooting, right? To get to that point of like, oh, I'm expected to <laughs> come across problems and I'm expected to learn how to fix them. And I emphasize the point that that's actually to me what the heart of research is. It's nothing's gonna be perfect and you're gonna like have this method that's gonna just, you're gonna run like a machine. The whole point of research is to face those problems and be able to, to troubleshoot them. And in addition to that important goal of being able to troubleshoot those issues when they arise, sometimes too, a bit of a downer on the, that students can experience, especially undergraduates, is when they run an experiment, the experiment seems to work fine, but the hypothesis didn't pan out. Nothing exciting happened. And it's in those instances, which are probably more common than not uh, in a lot of 
research projects, I make it a point to get really excited with the student, so much so that they get really confused. And I say, that is, I'm so glad you made that discovery because b before you did that experiment, we had no idea that that variable was going to have no effect on that dependent variable. How awesome is it that we now know that that doesn't relate one to another? And they sort of look at me like, what? But, it, but my, my point is that the, the sort of non-results can play a really important role in what comes next, and it can inform the science that comes after that. Um, back to the chat. The, you guys are lighting up the chat, which is terrific. And so I'm, I'm going to um, actually do something a little bit different. Uh, Morella Shamel, are you still with us? Morella, are you here? Uh, yes, I'm here. Morella, so. would you mind actually taking one of these questions? Because the question is, how do you prepare students for leaving a PUI doing research who are going to go on to conduct research at an R1 for graduate school? Uh, so Morella, you, maybe you can talk about your experiences. So as, as a graduate from my laboratory last May, um, maybe tell us a little bit about, uh, and feel free to be candid, you won't hurt my feelings, you already have your degree, um, <laughs> but, but were there experiences that you had in undergraduate research that you thought were particularly beneficial for where you're at now and what you're doing as a PhD student at the University of Southern California? Yeah, so like Dr. Sivi said, I graduated from his lab and I'm now at USC. I'm actually in lab right now. Um, Dr. Sivy was really good at kind of giving us opportunities to develop our skills. So from the get-go, he was like, okay, apply for research grants and travel grants and, um, you know, present at these conferences. So it allowed us to, like, develop skills with grant writing and, you know, giving presentations and poster making that um, really helped prep me. So coming into graduate school, I kind of felt like I was ready. I didn't feel like I just kind of like stumbled into, you know, an unknown place. Um, so that I would say, and um, he was kind of like, he was always available for, you know, if we had questions or whatever, his office was always open, but he was very hands off. So once we kind of had been trained, he was like, all right, you, you know, do the research, come to me with results. We can talk some stuff over. If you have any questions, I'm here. But other than that, it was kind of up to us. So I was able to build my like kind of independent research skills. And then I would go to like my peers in lab first. I'd be like, okay, do you know this? And then I would go to him. So building those collaborative skills. Um, me. I also saw a question that was about the NSF grant. So um, that also, those skills helped build that so I did end up applying for an NSF grant and I got it but starting from my first semester in research being able to write an undergraduate research grant and then going you know expanding those skills um, I think was a really helpful thing. And, and thanks for tackling two questions in one then Morella the, um, the, the other chat question was uh, do faculty members at PUIs ever coach students for PhD fellowships like the NSF Graduate Research Fellowship? And as Morella pointed out, yes, yes, in fact, you can and, and do as, as uh, uh, faculty members. And I'll point out that Dr. Uh, Devadas recently mentored uh, a Goldwater Scholarship recipient. So at the PUI, you're going to have a chance to mentor um, students who are going to be able to compete for these um, nationally competitive fellowships, including those that you won't get any financial return on the investment. Like in Morella's case, all of that money correctly went with her to graduate school and at Towson or my lab didn't get a dime of that uh, NSF graduate research fellowship but it's I still view that as a really important and valued contribution um, because I have a whole separate category on my CV called awards received by mentees and I list the the awards that my mentees have received uh, Morella is is represented several times in that list so thank you Morella for all of your hard work and filling up that category in my CV um, as well as many other I feel really fortunate to, to have worked with many students like Morella who've been um, really hard working toward that end um, so let's see, what was the next question on the list here? Um, Mala asks, there's a repetitive theme of research at PUI being more fundamental, but what if you still want to do cutting edge research with undergraduate students? Is that institution dependent or is that still a possibility? Um, Dr. Solis, would you like to, to tackle that question, please? Uh, well, I'll try. Um, so I, I mean, I do applied research um, and in part, and I, I did maybe more fundamental research um, 
when I was at Texas Tech, but just the way things happen, um, you know, I've been doing very applied research. Um, so I don't really, I don't know, I guess I don't really have much of a distinction there in terms of cutting edge. We're, I think you can do cutting edge research. Um, and even if you don't necessarily have the bandwidth or the, the, the capacity uh, or instrumentation by, by partnering, partnering with others um, and building collaborations, you can certainly participate, I, in my opinion, kind of in research across the spectrum. I mean, you may not be able to do it all in-house, um, but I don't see any reason why you can't, you know, it kind of really comes down to um, your interests and the opportunities that you pursue um, kind of more than, more than anything. I think Dr. So had mentioned earlier, you know, that sometimes being at a, at a PUI provides kind of the flexibility to maybe pursue questions because you don't necessarily, you know, that, that really interest you for whatever reason. And may, you may think it's cutting edge, it may be cutting edge, it may be more fundamental um, because there's not this necessarily this huge pressure to bring in a giant grant. Um, but at the same time, there's, you perfectly, there, there, no one's going to say, no, don't do that. So, uh, and they'll, they'll support you. Um, so really, in my opinion, I think that being at a PUI just gives you kind of more flexibility in some ways to kind of choose where you want to be and pursue things um, that really interest you. And some of that might be big grants that, you know, are, are applied or cutting edge or whatever. So um, I guess that's kind of my perspective. And the next question sort of segues nicely from that. Um, and the question is, how have your experiences been collaborating with other institutions and what role do collaborations play with that? Um, Dr. Devadas, and then I'll go to Dr. So after that. Um, could, you, could you both speak to um, both within your group, but then also more generally in your observations in your department, in your college, what role collaboration plays in scholarship? Um, so as far as collaboration goes, uh, I can give an example. A quick example is when I started out here, we didn't have uh, a TEM or an SEM to characterize my uh, nanoparticles and uh, nanomaterials that the students were making. So then I had to collaborate with R1s, uh, which had that uh, uh, instrument. So you just have to find the uh, right person to work with. I haven't f uh, found a problem finding a collaborator for the things that I needed whether external or uh, internal within uh, departments. So, and I know for a fact that uh, several uh, of my colleagues too have um, uh, collaborations with R1 institutions. So I, uh, it depends on, of course, whose door you knock on and if they are willing to uh, help you. And for the most part, you make these contacts uh, as a student, as a graduate student or a postdoc, and you also make uh, connections at uh, 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 conferences that you go to. So you got to keep your eyes and ears open if you want something. Like I said in the beginning, if there is a will, there is a way. You will find the right collaborator to do the right, uh, I mean, to get you the data that you need. And in my experience, having um, multiple NSF grants funded where I, my group has been collaborating with an R1 institution. Um, the R1 institutions that I've been working with are very open um, to working with ambitious research groups at PUIs, um, in part not just because of the intellectual contribution that our the PUI can make. Um, also, as I mentioned before, undergraduates are inexpensive. So I can pay four or five undergraduates for the price of one PhD student when I'm putting budgets together for these grants. So as a as a professor at a PUI, you're not going to sink the entire, you're not going to absorb the entire budget of that collaborative grant, and you're still going to be able to involve a lot of students. So there's a budgetary benefit, um, but then there's a broader impact benefit as well. Um, a lot of proposals coming specifically and exclusively from R1 institutions, they get um, declined by agencies like NSF on the grounds of insufficient broader impacts. Well, if you have a collaborator at a PUI, you are checking that broader impact box almost automatically. Um, so you as a PUI faculty member are bringing value to those proposals um, automatically. Um, Dr. So, would you like to speak to the role of collaborations at Lafayette? Um, so one thing that hasn't been mentioned about collaboration so far is, you know, 
are how are they viewed favorably for promotion and tenure? Um, and at least in Lafayette, they're not they're not considered bad. They're not considered extra good, right? I think it's 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 just you know if you can get your research done, collaborative or not, that's good. That might be different than an R one where you really need to show that you can do things on your own as well. You can you should can and should do some collaborative work, but you need to show you know that you have your whole like you know independent research as well. Um, I will caution you that at PUIs you also should show that you can do some on your own. You shouldn't completely rely on collaborations, but um, they're not you know seen as necessarily uh, a negative on, on that front. In terms of research as a whole, I think my advice might be if you want to do collaborations and be successful in the research trade, try and figure out what is your niche and what is your like specialty? How can you add value to other people, right? And think about how that can work with, with um, you know, the, the people that you're they're interested in. Um, whether that's you approaching other people or you being so valuable that people will approach you with your particular skill set. Um, noting that, you know, people will only do that if your research is really good. And so the last thing I'd like to say about, I guess, research, like doing research, is that I don't think research at undergraduate institutions is worse, right? The thing that I say, the pace of your research might not be as as high, right? You're not going to be as productive. But I think that the level of research should be just as high, right? Um, if you're putting in a grant, they're not going to give you a dispensation for saying, oh, you know, this is not very exciting research, but they're a PUI. That's not true. They need to see that this is very good research. It's fundamentally put together and they understand, like, it, it makes sense. Um, and if it's a PUI, great, right? Um, and then in terms of publishing, right, I've had colleagues publish in Nature and in JAX, right? Um, and they're doing really high level research um, and it just might not be as much research as, as you might, um, might think of otherwise. Thank you very much, Dr. So. And, and just to help folks get a sense of what that productivity difference looks like. And again, it can vary dramatically from one type of PUI to another. But the national average for a professor at a PUI is that they're publishing 0.5 paper per year across all types of PUIs. Now, I have to admit that the, the panelists that I've invited today um, are exceeding that national average in many instances quite dramatically. Um, but, but that's sort of where, where things fall. And so you'll want to get a sense if you end up in an academic position at a PUI to figure out what is the expectation. Some, some colleges, some departments will sort of have these unwritten rules in terms of number of papers that they'll expect to see. And it's often not written down anywhere, but it's sort of like in, in my college, for example, it's sort of a, a, an open secret that if you don't have three papers, by the time you're coming up for tenure, you're, there's going to be a lot of scrutiny on the scholarship front. Um, uh, but again, that can somewhat vary from college to college and department um, to department. So thank you very much uh, for, for sharing those insights, Dr. So. And I, I, I think your observations are spot on in terms of my experience at Towson with respect to collaborations. I know at some R1s, if you're involved in collaborations, then promotion and tenure committees might give you like half credit for a paper that you collaborated on or figure out, well, you weren't the corresponding author or you weren't the only corresponding author, so we're gonna award fractional credit for that paper. That has never come up at Towson in my years of reviewing promotion and tenure dossiers. Um, it's, as Dr. So pointed out, it's viewed as, it is what it is. It's a paper and, and you're going to get credit for, for that work. Um, Sophia had another question in the chat that, that I think is an important one, and this is circling back to recruiting. It was mentioned that a lot of students who are involved in research are self-selective and have good grades. For most of those cases, I'm assuming that it's because they've had the academic training, training that leads to that. How do you go about recruiting underserved students who haven't had those same opportunities, especially considering the fact that the academy desperately needs more diversity and that a PUI can serve as a bridge to graduate level research? Uh, Dr. Devadas, would you mind starting the conversation uh, on that important question? Sure. Um, I, in As far as my recruiting style goes, I normally don't look at the GPA as the first, uh, uh, what to say, the, the first check, check mark that they need to be admitted in the lab. I look for motivation. So it doesn't matter whether these students are prepared or not. So 
uh, if they're not prepared, it just means that they are going to have additional time shadowing, right, in the lab to pick up the skills that they need to move forward with. And sometimes uh, I have gone um, uh, the extra step where I make them enroll in, uh, uh, re in uh, it's not a research credit, but it's kind of, uh, it's called special investigations in chemistry, where one semester they're just purely le reading the literature and summarizing it and submitting an annotated bibliography, for example. And then, so they get a feel for that work and then they go on to the next step where, is at, where they will begin to actually shadow the experimental part of the work. So I tell the uh, training depends on um, and varies a lot from student to student. And uh, to point out to Sophia again, these students who have a high GPA, I want to emphasize, are not your best experimentalists. So uh, please don't misunderstand that these high GPA students have the skills already. They don't have the experimental skills to begin with. It's just that in school, they are doing better, that's all. So I don't differentiate between that GPA, but yes, after they join the lab, if they're still going down, then I tell them to take a break from research, pick up their grades and uh, come back to lab. And, they, and there are two examples in that uh, situation, a students with um, a disability and uh, a student from an underrepresented community. When I gave them this as their target that they cannot get anything lower than a B in, their, in uh, any of their courses, they have definitely uh, made the effort to bring up their GPA and have continued and have been very successful in research. And to build upon what Dr. Devadas was saying, in my experience, being involved in research tends to have a positive benefit on students' GPAs thereafter, um, where it tends to sort of increase their motivation, not just for research, but for their coursework as well. Um, so I think that there can be a synergistic effect between uh, GPA uh, as a metric for academic success in their research performance. Uh, Christiana, you had a question in the chat about do PUIs offer internships to outside students? Um, Christiana, would you mind clarifying for me what, uh, what you meant by students? So PUIs offer internships to outside like undergraduates and are you thinking of like research internships? Could you tell me a little bit about that? Yes, yeah, so I'm thinking about research and in internships from students from other institutions. For, for example, you may see uh, internships at R1s for students from other institutions. Yes, so in fact, Towson has hosted like NSF, REU type experiences, research experiences for undergraduates. Um, PUIs can do that as a faculty member at a PUI, you can um, write grants to NSF to be able to get funding to host those types of research experiences for undergraduates. So yes, that is definitely something that PUIs can participate in. And that often will take the shape of a consortium. Increasingly now NSF likes to give money to groups of universities to be able to do these types of, of experiences. So it's just a few minutes from four, so I want to wrap up by first of all thanking um, all of you for participating. Um, I, I, you, you wrote the script for me as participants today. I didn't even have to go through very many of my prescribed questions because you, you met and exceeded those in the chat. So thank you very much for your active participation. Um, I would invite everyone to head to the chat right now and please extend thanks to the panelists, um, Dr. Chris Solis, Dr. Mary Devadas, and Dr. Lindsay So for generously sharing their time and their insights and their experiences with us this afternoon. Thank you all very much. And I invite uh, all of the attendees today to join us for day three, our final day tomorrow, same time, same place, where I have invited several administrators from Towson University to give us insider information about what makes a successful application. How can you turn your application into an interview and then your interview into a job offer at a primarily undergraduate institution? So thank you all very much. This concludes today's session. I'll invite the panelists to stay on for a few more minutes, if you would, please. Um, but everyone else, thank you very much. Have a great day.